stable coins. We've been talking about this for some time. They may be coming under closer scrutiny by lawmakers, but that's not stopping entrepreneurs from launching new stable coins or venture capitalists from invest, investing in their projects. Uh, one new example is a yield paying algorithmic stable coin launched by Sperex. And that's captured crypto VC interest from the likes of Amber Group, Alameda Research, and DJ Steve Aoki. Joining us to discuss is Marco DiMaggio, uh, an advisor to Sperex, who's also an associate professor at Harvard, Biz Harvard Business School. Welcome, Marco. Hi, thank you so much for having me. So, look, these are not the necessarily the easiest things to explain to people, so I'm going to have to ask you to give it a shot, though, in layman terms, since our viewers across the gamut in terms of their understanding of, of crypto. How, do, how does this particular algorithmic coin work in terms of how it enables its stability against uh, its benchmark? Yeah, so let me let me start by just saying that uh, they solve one potential issue, which is that uh, so far the uh, the stable coins that are out there are mostly crypto collateralized or have reserves. Both of these have one big issue, which is the lack of scalability. You have a lot of capital that is sitting idle, even more so because to make sure that these are stable, you need to over collateralize. So for every one extra coin worth one dollar, you have to put down more than one dollar worth of collateral. This means that once the protocol gets adopted, then you want to scale the usage and the the, the, um, the adoption of the of the coin. What you are going to end up having is a lot of capital sitting there. So one way of solving this issue is by proposing a stable coin that is algorithmic. Algorithmic means it has a, another token that you can use to collateralize the uh, the stable coin. This the Perax one it's actually a mixture, and this is one of uh, the uh, the things that makes it uh, pretty unique. Uh, what that means is that it's taking both designs and it's trying to take uh, sort of the good side of both designs. What that means is that uh, you are going to have a part of it that is crypto collateralized and part of it that is algorithmic. And why that's the case is because at the beginning, you need a lot of trust into the protocol to have actually the algorithmic part working. And so at the beginning, you are going to be much more collateralized than uh, you are going to be one year after the launch, for instance, once people are sure that this is indeed stable and everything is working out. And so uh, the Sperax uh, protocol allows exactly for that dynamics, allows for a starting point where most of it, 95%, is collateralized. And then as the scale uh, goes up, you are going to end up being more and more algorithmic over time. And the way in which it works, so, I think the best way of thinking about it, let me just say this, is the best way of thinking about it is really buy low and sell high, which is, you know, first principle finance 101. Meaning that you always have a protocol that allows you to to get this stable coin worth one dollar, and so every time it is above and below, you have an arbitrage incentives to buy or sell and re, re bring it back to the uh, to the bag. So, Professor DiMaggio, we, we we had an example of a of a of such an algorithmic stable coin that that did have a balancer, um, and it failed spectacularly. That was the um, to iron titanium I don't know. Uh, yeah. stable coin. Yeah. And right now we also have Terra Luna, we have UST, uh, which is the, the, the dominant one in the market. Um, what is it that, that you're doing that is different than those, uh, than those two examples, either in, in, in success and failure? Yeah, so from the failure point of view, we have a stability mechanism that uh, takes that, uh, uh, that sort of avoids exactly that type of dynamics, meaning you have uh, outflows and inflows swap fees that are going to increase as the outflow increase, meaning you are not going to be able to sell at the same rate and it's going to become more and more economically costly for you to sell and liquidate and so uh, dump basically the uh, the token uh, as more people are doing so. Then we also have circuit breaker that are on chain and that makes sure that uh, as the price basically goes down, you stop trading so that if the, the reaction is an irrational reaction to some short term news, you are not going to fail the whole stable coin just for, uh, for an event like that. And so on the stability, we totally thought about that. And in fact, we used the data to show that uh, the, the Sperac stablecoin would also uh, you know, survive an attack like that. 
So, it, it, but nonetheless, if you do delay the, the the sale, doesn't doesn't necessarily mean it stops, correct? I mean, you can you can keep delaying and delaying and delaying, but if you have a soft landing, if you will, and and if you lose interest in this in the stablecoin in the balancer, and people start withdrawing, wouldn't that create almost a death spiral? I mean, what what way can you stop a death spiral in an algorithmic stablecoin that you wouldn't have in an asset backed stablecoin? And in this case, I think it's super easy in the sense that at the beginning, uh, you start with 95% collateralized and 5% uh, algorithmic. And so worst case scenario, and even if you delay and even if it, this is not a short term news, uh, something happens, what's going to happen is that at the end of the day, it's going to converge to 0.95 cents, right? And so that's already a big uh, stability mechanism because at the very beginning, you are uh, collateralized. And so you're going to use that. And then the other thing is that the the, the fees increase as more people uh, uh, sell it. And so that also limits uh, the incentive for people to uh, actually selling it. You know, if they lose confidence, they're going to lose confidence on the portion that is algorithmic and on the portion that is crypto collateralized. That's why I think it's very important and very useful to have that at the beginning when I think you have to build trust. and But you have then the ability as things go on to move back uh, to the algorithmic part. Marco, recently stablecoins have come onto the radar of U.S. regulators, and you know we're, we're probably going to see increased stablecoin regulation coming this year. How how do algorithmic stablecoins fit into the regulatory framework? Because one of the big concerns of regulators is that you know these stablecoins weren't pro- aren't properly backed by fiat currency, right? But algorithmic stablecoins are clearly another story. Do you think they'd be easier or harder to regulate, and 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 how would they even be regulated? I think one issue with the existing uh, stablecoin is the lack of transparency and really the lack of accountability. But, I mean, uh, Tether is sort of the elephant in the room. It can disrupt the, the markets because it's the one that is adopted by the most uh, investors. It's the one that is systemically important. And so it's obviously the one that uh, people have paid the most attention to. What really I think concerned regulators so far is the lack of uh, transparency into uh, what is, is actually the reserves? What have you invested in? As you all know, there have been the news about investing in commercial paper uh, of Chinese companies. That for a traditional finance guy like me, that this is my, you know, this is my background, uh, that reminds me a lot of the prime reserve fund, uh, you know, the mining market fund that collapsed during the financial crisis that invested in commercial paper issued by Lehman Brothers. That's sort of exactly the same thing. And so I think it's, it's very easy to think about the, the, the regulator as worrying about these uh, analogy. Are we, you know, at the end of the day, they are performing exactly the same function as a money market fund. We should regulate them, uh, regulate them as uh, very similar to those type of institutions. Um, so I think that's one uh, issue that uh, I think is pretty big. Uh, the other thing that uh, I want to add is that uh, the decentralization I think is one aspect that is helpful for uh, stable coins, meaning that, for instance, Sperax is going to be a decentralized one, meaning that, for instance, the type of collateral that uh, the protocol is going to be willing to accept is going to be decided by the community. And everything is on chain. And so this helps both on the transparency side as well as on saying, look, this is, there is no one single entity, no single foundation that is going to take the reign of these and decide what is accepted or not or where we are going to invest this money. But it's the community that has a stake into the protocol that uh, is going to decide where it goes. I think the, uh, the big ask for the regulator is to be uh, subtle enough to distinguish between stable coin. What I'm worried about is an approach that is a little bit more of a big brush and putting them all together and uh, trying to regulate all together. I think they need to be a little bit more subtle in thinking about uh, exactly what are the forces that uh, make a stable coin systemically important, what are the forces that make them riskier than others. So if you have a, a basically a mixed bag of uh, of what's backing the the this barracks, so you have you have uh, algorithmic and you have uh, collateral. What what exactly is in the collateral? What what would be the what is the mix? How how is it decided? Um, and how, where is it held? All those kind of questions um, that you would normally ask of an asset backed stablecoin. How is it? How is it with you guys? Yeah, so most of those are going to be uh, um, stable coins at the beginning. 
So even the same tether that I was mentioning, since it's the largest one out there, is going to be accepted. And then as a spare uh, the, the SPA token uh, gets uh, to more and more uh, uh, people, then uh, the type yes. of uh, uh, the type of uh, collateral that can be accepted is going to be decided then uh, by the community, and so it potentially can be expanded to, uh, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, plus other uh, other um, reserve uh, uh, collateral. Uh, it, you you just mentioned that that there is some questions about the the backing of those stable coins. So th does that essentially create a, a a problem for your own? In other words, if you have assets that are based on things that that uh, may have uh, credit issues and what have you. Does that then affect your own uh, stablecoin's assets? And it, you know, if you have a volatile asset like Bitcoin, uh, how do you collateralize it if the volatility is so high? Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, are you doing it one for one, or are you going to have to do like three no, x, four x for it to make sense? No, no, obviously not. So that's that's sort of the the part that uh, it's more uh, standard in some sense. You know the part that is uh, collateralized. You are gonna have. You are gonna be over collateralizing uh, the assets that are volatile. But since at the beginning uh, it's uh, stable coins, you don't really need to do that. And the question about tether, we sort of open up to the community what they want to uh, use as collateral. And since that's the biggest one, it was sort of shooting ourselves in the foot, thinking that not to accept <laughs> that uh, at the beginning. But if the community evolves and, and uh, sort of agrees that. Uh, the market needs to move away from a centralized one, uh, then that's basically where uh, they are going. 